We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a podcast, a blog, and a YouTube channel that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home with paint, power tools, and thrift stores without sacrificing your budget, the environment, or style. Welcome to episode 80 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. I cannot believe I'm already at 80. <laughs> and I've been doing this consistently since January 2021. Well, today's Sunday as I'm recording. August 21st. And of course, I know my podcasts are supposed to go live on Friday. But I don't know, I think as long as it goes between third uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's all good. I'm here. And today we're talking about a fun topic. It is something that again is relevant to my week. But this is probably something that's relevant to you when you're working on DIY projects, we're going to talk about spray paint. You know, I realized some of the previous episodes, and I'll link to them down below that we've talked about, a lot of it has been talking about chalk-based paint, maybe talking about a few furniture paints that have top coats already built into them. And I will be talking about one of them today because it relates to a project that I'm doing this week. It's by Heirloom Traditions Paint. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Very little, but a little bit. I'll mention it because it's relevant. But I realized I've never really spoken much about spray paint. And I started thinking, well, why is that? Why do I not talk about spray paint? So there's a few reasons why I don't really like talking about it because I don't use it. And why are the reasons why I don't generally use it? Well, number one, I think it's disgustingly hideous. <laughs> when when you start spraying that stuff, it just gets into your nose, even if you're wearing a mask, I still feel like unless you're wearing a respirator mask, you can still smell it. And the smell just permeates. It's just, ugh, I don't like the smell of it. And for me, it's so offensive. And I feel that it lingers for a long time. And I know that has to do with the curing, you know, once it cures, it's not going to smell. But me personally, I just don't like the smell of it. It's very offensive. So that's one of the reasons why I choose not to use it. The second reason is because you have to use it outside. And, you know, it's really funny when you go to some of these websites for these different brands of paint, they'll tell you, oh, you can use this indoors, you can use it outdoors, just make sure you have a lot of ventilation. And in my experience, this has to be done outdoors because with the amount of odor that it's, you know, that it's causing, the amount of, uh, particles that are lingering in the air for a long time. That's not really something that you want to do inside. And have I spray painted inside? I'm pretty sure I have. <laughs> and again, that stuff will linger for a long period of time. So with chalk paints and other paints, you know, furniture paints, those things can be done indoors, whether it's summertime, spring, fall, winter, it doesn't matter what season you can do those inside. You can do it in your garage. Now that I've got a shed, I can do that in my shed and I don't have to be outside. So that's one reason why I like using other paints and not spray paint. And also with spray paint, I feel that it can be sticky for a long period of time. Even if you're using like a flat or a satin finish, I mean, especially if you use semi-gloss or gloss, that's, to me, it feels sticky for quite a long period of time. I mean, even after it cures, it just feels, I don't like the feel of it. You know, one of the first projects that I did for my kitchen. This was a pedestal table that my mom had given me, had some stools, and I had never painted anything before. This was the very first project that I did here in my house. And I just remembered, I mean, even after it cured, it just smelled for a long period of time. And my kitchen just had that, that nasty smell to it that I didn't like. And I thought it was just a very messy project. So that's another reason. And then the fourth reason is almost always I've been disappointed with spray painting results. You know, it runs if you're using it outdoors, which is, again, where you should be using it in the summertime. If you're using it, you're going to get bugs stuck to the surface. <laughs> There's nothing worse than thinking that you've got a really good finish and you come back. And even after you've tried to protect it, there's always a gnat or a fly or something that's stuck in, in the surface of the paint. I mean, it just happens. And so that's what I don't like. 
And, you know, when you're doing like large or flat surfaces, I, I find, well, we'll talk about that in just a moment, but basically I just have never really been that happy with the results that I get from spray painting. And I think that there are certain things that it's useful for. For example, like if you're doing flower pots, lamps, I think for lamps, I mean, it's perfect because it's just such a small area, surface area that it's almost like you can't mess it up when it's on something that's so small. And you know, several years ago, and I will leave a link down below in the show notes, I made over my mailbox and it was this really pretty turquoise and the little arm that goes up, usually it's red, the little arm that goes up to tell the man, I was going to say mailman, but I'm going to use the politically correct word, the mail carrier. (laughs) It lets the mail carrier know that, hey, you've got something in here that needs to be taken I spray painted that pink and it's been probably four years, maybe five years. And that paint has still held up. So spray paint can be very durable, especially in, you know, if you're using it in an, ex- in, an exterior uh, way, like with a mailbox, it's small, a mailbox is, or a lamp, those things. I think spray paint has a pretty good reputation for getting you good results. Or if you're spray painting something like wicker or outdoor furniture. It's very quick and easy. So it does have its place in projects, but beyond that, I don't like to use it for furniture. Can you use it for furniture? Yes, you can. You don't have to use furniture paints, you know, that are specifically deemed as furniture paints. But me personally, I just prefer to use it for, you know, for those smaller projects. But I'll tell you, This week, there's a project that I'm working on. It's actually sponsored by Savers, the thrift store brand. And they wanted me to do something simple. They didn't want me to, you know, do a furniture makeover that's that's too difficult for just a common everyday DIY or maybe even somebody who's a newbie who's never even done a furniture makeover before. So I went to the thrift store looking for a goodie. I love when I have to go to the thrift store and I have something that I'm looking for. (laughs) you know, you see it and you know, it's perfect. Like that's coming home with me. Well, I found this, I mean, it was $5 and gosh, was it like $5 and 95 cents or something like that? It was like under $60, under $6. And it was a file cabinet, but not the one that pulls from the front, right? Like the normal file cabinets we think of are like the ones that have two drawers and you just pull it open and put your files in there and great. No, this one was a little bit different. This one had a shelf on the bottom and then it had a file cabinet, but instead of pulling out, it lifted up. So you could lift it up, it sort of folds back behind it and you've got space in there for your hanging file folders. And it was less than $6. I was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. And it was ugly too. It had some rust on it. It was not a pretty color, just that bland almond color and it was very dirty. So I thought this is great. It's going to make a a pretty easy makeover. I think even if you're a newbie, you can do something like this. And I brought it home. It was perfect. So when I got it home, I realized, okay, the first thing that I need to do is I have to remove this rust because whenever you're doing some project that is metal, that's got rust, you really want to remove that rust because, I mean, I don't know a lot about rust, But I know it's not something that you just want to paint over. You want to try to remove as much of it as you can. And when I went to Home Depot, I bought some, I think it was like a Rust-Oleum rust remover. I'd never used this particular kind before, but it worked so well. And I sprayed it on, let it sit there for about, I think it says maybe like five to 10 minutes, depending on how much rust you have. And this didn't have a lot of rust. It was just some, some spots. And, you know, it's really funny because on the directions, it said, do not let the material dry, right? Like, do not let the surface dry. Make sure that you keep it wet. And after it's been on there for five or 10 minutes, or when you've noticed that the rust is starting to remove, be removed, then you can take uh, some water, wipe it down and remove all of the the chemicals. Well, now I know exactly why they told me (laughs) in the directions, do not let it dry on the surface. And I tried not to, but what I realized is that when you're working with 
a project and you're covering the entire thing. And again, this is a small file cabinet. It's not big. But when you're working with multiple surfaces, sometimes by the time you make it back to that first surface, it does start to dry. So as I'm starting to wipe it down with some hot water and just a microfiber towel, the finish on the file cabinet just started wearing away. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is not good. <laughs> because you've got some of the paint on there on the file cabinet, and then now you're down to the bare metal. And I was so worried that the spray paint that I was going to use on this metal cabinet, that it would look bumpy. And I didn't want that. And I didn't want to have to do a lot of sanding and a lot of prepping. Remember, this is supposed to be a, a an easy DIY project for just any newbie who's just beginning with DIY. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about that process. And after I cleaned off all the rust, what is it that I did in order to feel that this project was a success? Now, I'm not completely done. I did get the body of it painted, but now I'm at the point where I want to do some additional thing, maybe stencils or something to really give it a little bit of oomph, right? <laughs> so we're going to talk about what are some of the tips and some of the things that I realize, like as I'm working with this project, as I'm spraying this metal, did I even have to prime? Did I get drips? And if I did get drips, how did I take care of that so that it didn't look horrible? And I thought, you know, this would be a really good topic to talk about on the podcast because there were some things that I felt were pretty important for me to do in order to get good results with using spray paint on this, this little file cabinet. So let's talk about where we should actually be spray painting, right? I mentioned that you should spray paint outside, but I want to say specifically there is a product that I really, really like, and I don't pull it out too often. I think I actually need to get a new one, but it's a spray shelter. And I'm, I'm sure if you've been following DIY for any length of time, you've probably seen bloggers. You may have seen it on Instagram. What it is, it looks like a little tent and it may or may not zip up in the front. I think there are some that zip up in the front, but it's a spray shelter. And this is really good for when you're spraying projects outdoors. I mean, you probably could use it inside for, well, again, you don't want to spray inside, but if you had to, you could use it inside. But what it is, it looks like a little tent. They have small ones. They have large ones. I think they even have extra large ones for big pieces of furniture. And you're able to do your projects inside of this tent so that any falling leaves, any bugs that are swarming around, for the most part, your your project is going to be protected, right? You know, when you're doing DIY projects, it's all about the finish that you get. If you get a crappy finish, it makes you feel like the entire project should be scrapped <laughs> because you want that finish to be flawless or as, as flawless as possible. I mean, we don't go for perfection here at Thrift Diving, but you want it to be as flawless as possible. And if you've got bugs in the surface of it, if you've got leaves and debris, if it's that time of year, it's not going to make you feel good about your project. So I would definitely say, make sure that you pick up like a spray shelter or something that's going to protect your project from the outside elements. And also, you know, it can protect it from direct sunlight too. I have never had this experience but I have researched and have heard that if you're trying to spray paint in direct sunlight, you're going to get bad results. Like it could raise the paint and look kind of bumpy and that's not what you want. So you definitely want it to be in a shady spot. And if you are in direct sunlight, having the spray shelter will help. Now, if you can't afford a spray shelter and they're not very expensive, you could just use a cardboard box. If you lay it on its side, you can stick a project in there and make sure that you've got a tarp or some plastic down around on your grass or sidewalk or wherever it is that you're spraying and use that box as a place to spray. And it'll catch a lot of that overspray. And uh, if you're doing like smaller projects, you can do small boxes, just, you know, anything to keep that overspray from going everywhere. Because let me tell you, there was a project that I did, I want to say maybe about three years ago. And it was this is before I had my shed, my she shed. So I was in the garage, in the driveway, the sun was just starting to go down. And whatever project I was working on, I had to finish it. And I was spray painting. I think it was one of those little plastic playhouses that I'd done for some contest. 
I think it was with homes.com and, and I'll leave a link down below, but it, it was a really cute playhouse for kids. And it was myself and two other bloggers. We were competing to see who could get the most votes on the made over playhouse. I mean, it was a fun challenge, but the sun was going down, didn't have a lot of time left. So I pulled out one of my work lights, really powerful, bright light in order to finish spraying the parts I needed to spray. And as I sprayed, the beam of the light just exposed all of the particles floating around. Like I, I just literally couldn't believe it because in our minds, well, I don't want to say in our minds, but when we're spraying during the day, we smell it, but we don't see everything that's floating around. We seem to think that just because there's a breeze that that sort of that ventilation is is taking all of the the chemicals away from us, right? Well, no, it's actually just floating around us. And so when I had sh shine this this light, this work light into my work area, I could see all the particles floating around me. And I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> is this what I'm breathing in? If I don't wear a mask, is this what I'm breathing in? And we seem to think that being outdoors, just because we're outdoors, oh, we have plenty of ventilation. We don't have to wear a mask. When you see this video, and I will leave, leave a link to it down below, and I'll try to pinpoint the exact location of where you see in the spotlight all these particles floating around. But when you see that, it makes you realize, you know, we really have to take a take a um, more effort to protect ourselves from this overspray. And that's where I think a spray shelter comes in handy because when you're using a spray shelter or a cardboard box, you're confining that overspray to that area. So it's not floating all around. Your kids might be playing out, out nearby you and you think, well, we're outdoors, no big deal. Your dog, you know, any anybody in your family could, or in the neighborhood could be playing nearby and those particles are just flying everywhere. So that's another reason why you having a spray shelter or something to catch that overspray so it's not just going everywhere in your environment. So that's definitely important. And here's another thing too. Now this won't necessarily protect the overspray, but it will protect your grass. If you've got some scrap wood lying around, like I do, you can even make your own tray, like your spray painting tray. And I had one at some point, I don't know, I think I threw it away because it just got damaged or I think I left it out in the, in the elements <laughs> and it got damaged. But you can take some spray wood, uh, scrap wood and just create a box, right? And it, I'm not talking about a box that's like high. I'm just talking about a tray, no deeper than, I don't know, six, seven, eight inches. And when you're spray painting small things or like, let's say picture frames or anything like that, you would be able to just spray it inside of that tray and not have to pull out a tarp or piece of plastic or just ruin your grass. You would have everything contained in that spray tray. But again, that's not going to protect you from all the overspray. That's why I think a spray shelter really can help or a cardboard box over top of that spray tray in order to prevent all that stuff from, from going everywhere. So here's another tip in terms of um, not so much where you spray, but trying to make it easier. You could actually buy a Lazy Susan to make spray painting easier. Now, I don't think they cost too much money. I've even found them at the thrift store for not a lot of money, but you could make one, I would say probably for under $15 if you get the materials from Home Depot. And all it is, if you go into the wood aisle, they usually have those pre-cut round, I want to say it's probably like a 24 inch circumference piece of pine. You could get two of those. And Home Depot also sells a Lazy Susan turntable. It's like a four by four square piece of metal. And they have those little ball bearings in between it. So when you spin it and you attach it to the two pieces of wood, you've got a Lazy Susan. It's really, really simple to make. And I will leave a link down below where you can find that at Home Depot. Now, I will tell you just as a little aside, the one that you get at Home Depot is best for Lazy Susans. It's not for furniture. So if you ever think, oh, I'm going to make a stool with this Lazy Susan turntable, the one at Home Depot is just for Lazy Susans. <laughs> you can't use a stool. You can't use it to for like a piece of furniture. It just doesn't work. It doesn't have enough um, 
weight bearing capacity. And ask me how I know. <laughs> I tried to use one for like this stool makeover I was doing and it didn't work very well. So they do have ones that are more heavy duty. If you want that for like a stool that you're going to be making for sitting, or if you've got like a large piece of furniture that you're going to be making like a, a larger turntable for, um, or lazy Susan, then you would get the, you know, the more powerful uh, turntable than just the little one at Home Depot for like five bucks. Okay. So having that turntable, um, well, I keep calling it a turntable, but basically a turntable, like a lazy Susan turntable. The benefit of having that is when you've got your project sitting on there, you can easily turn it and rotate it so that you've got clean lines when you're spray painting. So just something to think about. I have, I think a video that I made for a small lazy Susan, and it was something that I did for my bathroom where I've got these little compartments so it's not completely a, a tutorial for one made for spray painting, but I will leave a link down below if you want to see how to make a, a lazy Susan. It's actually not too difficult at all. All right, so I don't want to take away the importance of cleaning your surface first. And I, I feel like it's common sense, but it's so important. And I know that for a lot of times, newbies, we just want to jump into a project and we don't want to spend time cleaning it. And spray paint is going to stick to whatever is on your project. <laughs> so if you've got fingerprints all over it, if you've got oils, grease, dirt, that's what the spray paint's going to stick to. And it's going to come off. It's going to rub off and you're going to get bad results. So I always tell people, make sure that you clean the surface first. I do like using Simple Green. I keep it on hand. You just spray it on wipe it off, but then you've got to go back with fresh water and you want to go over with a clean towel just to make sure you get all that simple green off. And then once it's clean, then you can start spraying. Um, but again, let me tell you, wear a mask. Those particles are floating everywhere. And I will, I will say that just having like an N95 na mask, I don't think it really blocks all the smell from spray paint. What I've found is that when you use one of those, not a full face mask, but you can do a half face mask ventilator with the filters that are made for chemicals, you you won't smell anything. And for me, that's what I like to wear. I don't necessarily always have it on hand, but you know, don't just wear one of the little masks that we're wearing when we go out to the grocery store. Or we're in crowds because of COVID. You know what I mean? Like, don't just wear those little masks that you know, like the surgical mask, those, they're not going to block anything um, spray paint related. All right. So make sure you wear your gloves too. That's very important. And here's one thing that I, I think, and I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience, but I think one step that we often overlook is how important it is to thoroughly shake your spray paint. I know for myself, when I, before, not now, but before when I would get started, I'd give it a, a few shakes, and a lot of times when you first shake it, you're not going to hear anything, but you should hear that marble inside shaking. That's what's breaking up all of the pigmentation inside and all the, the chemicals that are in there. So you want to make sure that you're following the recommendations on the back for how long to shake it. And from what I understand, if I remember correctly, usually it's about a minute, one to two minutes, you should be shaking up this spray paint so that you're going to get good results. You're only going to get as good results as your preparation. And part of your preparation should be thoroughly shaking it beforehand. And then as you're spraying, which we'll get to in a moment, be sure to keep shaking that, making sure that you're, you're keeping that constantly moving so that you're going to get great results. And here is the key to getting good results with spray paint. I don't know about you. Again, I can only speak from my own experience. And I know there are other people that have this experience, but spray paint, I don't know how good you have to be to get spray paint results with no drips, but it doesn't matter how far away I try to spray. I always <laughs> get runs when I spray paint, always. And even though the recommended, I believe it's like, what, eight to 10 inches away, you should have the spray paint, spray paint can move in continuously at eight to 10 inches away. I, if that piece of furniture is sitting vertically 
and I'm spray painted it, I will always get runs. In fact, when I took this little file cabinet outside, I put some boxes down on the, or opened up some boxes and had it sitting there. I was trying my best to make sure that I was not close up because the closer you are to what you're spraying, it is going to, I mean, it is going to be a hot mess. You are going to create so much puddles on your piece of furniture or whatever it is that you're spraying, your lamps, whatever, that it's, it's automatically going to run. But even if in my, in my experience, even if you're eight to 10 inches away, it still runs because what's gravity doing? Gravity is pulling that paint down unless you're creating such a fine layer that there's no way gravity is moving that. I mean, it's just a very light pigment of, of, of a layer on your furniture. I feel like that's the only way it's not going to run. So what I decided to do, and this takes longer, but this is a tip that's going to work for you. And especially if it's a small piece of furniture, whatever side you're spraying, lay it flat and spray it when it is laying flat. And if you do that and give it time to dry, you know, maybe give it about 20 minutes for each side to dry, you're going to get better results than if you just try to set it up right and you're going eight to 10 inches away, even at 12 inches, um, you're still going to see some runs. And that's what was happening with me when I went out there, I had it set up right. I was very cognizant of making sure I wasn't too close. I started spraying and I'm thinking, oh, this is going great. And then the light hit it in a certain way. And I saw those runs and I was like, shoot, I tried. <laughs> oh, that's frustrating. So then I, lie, I I laid it down and I just did one side at a time, let it dry maybe about 15, 20 minutes and then flipped it over. Now, the only thing is, is when you have done three sides, you're going to get to a point where you've got to do that last side. In that case, you may want to come back the next day if it's later in the afternoon or evening, or if it's earlier in the morning, you might want to wait for several hours before you flip that over onto a side that you just did and then finish off that fourth side. Now, here's a piece of advice that I found really helpful on a blog. I don't even remember where I found it, but she had also said, look, I only can spray when things are just lying down. That's just the only thing that's ever worked for me. But she had a really good tip. She said, when you're turning this piece over, make sure that you're putting down a piece of fresh plastic or paper or whatever it is that you're putting down, uh, maybe a clear area of tarp. Because what could happen is as you're spraying, you're getting some of that overspray onto the plastic, the tarp, the cardboard, whatever it is that you're protecting the grass from. As you turn this piece over and you've got fresh paint on your project and there's fresh paint on the tarp, when those two fresh surfaces collide, they're probably going to stick to each other. <laughs> and that's not what you want. And so I'm glad that she had pointed that up because pointed that out because that is something that has happened to me before in the past when I've laid down something that I've spray painted and there's paint or overspray on the floor, on the ground, and you're going to flip it over and now you've pulled up some of that paint. So just be mindful of that when you are turning a piece over, make sure you've got a clear area that doesn't have any paint on it so it doesn't want to stick to that. And here's another area. If you're doing small objects like screws, knobs, nails, because let's face it, sometimes those things have to get painted as well. You might want to either stick them in some cardboard or try to keep small pieces of styrofoam when you get shipments of things. Keep some of the styrofoam, maybe break off some of the pieces and use that to stick them into the styrofoam or the cardboard and then use that when you're spraying so that you can keep them elevated and be able to just rotate that and get all sides of those small objects. Typically what I've done in the past, although I have done this when I was when I was refinishing some legs on a dresser, but typically what I've done in the past is you're doing knobs and you come and you have to like spray one part of the knob, wait until it dries, you know, 20 minutes later, come back and turn it over, spray the other side. And that's kind of a pain. You want to be able to get it done efficiently and make sure that when you're, you know, if you're turning things over, you don't necessarily want to have to do that because again, it can scuff up some of your, your spray paint. So that is a helpful tip that I found. And in fact, I actually have some pieces of styrofoam that I was just about to throw out 
that I'm going to collect. And they're the perfect size. I mean, gosh, they're like four by six pieces of styrofoam that came in some shipment. Oh, I know what it was. The skylight blinds that I'm currently installing now, they came in the blinds and I was just about to throw them away. And I was like, wait a minute, I can use that for spray paint. So I will be sticking them in my pile of need this later. You know, another thing that works really well too is the Pink Panther insulation pieces. If you go to, I think it might just be Home Depot. I'm sure Lowe's has another brand. I'm, well, I'm not really partial to the Pink Panther, but it's this, the insulation foam that you can get from the insulation aisle. This is good when you're using, if you remember from a previous episode where I was talking about power tools, this is good when you're using a circular saw because the saw can cut right through that insulation. If you're cutting a board, right, and you need a safe place to cut, you can actually cut on the ground as long as you have a piece of insulation foam on which to rest your wood, you can cut on the ground with your circular saw. Well, if you have a piece of this that you just cut off and use for spray paint, you can also use that to, you know, attach your screws or your nails or anything that you need to spray paint and put that in the insulation piece. And that stuff, let me tell you, that Pink Panther insulation, that foam insulation, it lasts forever. I've got a piece like a, I don't know what size they come in, but they're, I want to say probably two feet by eight feet. And I think you might be able to get it smaller. I'm not sure. But I've had that piece in my garage for probably five years, if not more. And I'm still using it sometimes when I'm using the circular saw. And if I'm cutting on the ground, especially big sheets of plywood, you know, four by eight sheets of plywood, it's very simple to put them on the ground and just cut with the insulation foam underneath to support. And it doesn't matter how many times you cut it, it just doesn't fall apart. (laughs) It's amazing. So definitely pick up some of that. I will try to remember to leave a link down below. If not, just go to Home Depot or Lowe's, go to the insulation aisle, look for the foam, like a two inch piece, two inch thick piece, and just add that to your DIY toolbox. Okay. So, you know, as I mentioned with drips, they're so much more likely to happen when you're using spray paint. I just think they're hideous and, and they could require a lot of sanding So here are some things that, in addition to laying things down, that I think might help. So again, try to keep it 8 to 10 inches away. Try to lay it flat. You know, don't stand it up when you're painting it. Even if you have to take something apart, if you can lay some of those parts flat, you're going to get better results. But make sure that you keep the man, keep the man, keep the can moving. (laughs) Yeah, keep the man, keep the can moving and you want to overshoot the edges. So when you get to the edge of whatever it is you're spray painting, you don't want to stop and then move it in the other direction. Like you always want to go past the edge so that you've got a nice clean edge because the minute you stop spraying, you're going to get a, a bunch of paint that just accumulates in that one area and it looks horrible. And then what could happen is the exterior of that is going to dry, but the paint underneath is not going to dry. And then it's going to crack. Once you have those cracks, it's very hard to fix that. Very hard to fix that. So it's best to do several small, or I say not small, several thin layers of paint than just to do one big glob of paint. That's never going to look nice. And make sure again, that you don't overwork the paint. So sometimes when you're spray painting, you might have some spots that seem kind of bare, right? So as you're overlapping, you're going back and forth, you're trying to overlap, you're going over the edges and you're overlapping your paint. There are times when some of that paint doesn't seem to be as thick in some areas. And so you'll see some of the the material from underneath showing through. Don't overwork it and think that you got to go back over it and keep adding layers. Just totally wait until it dries for maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes, something like that, maybe an hour, and then come back and do your second coat. That's the best thing because when you overwork paint, you end up just making more of a mess of it. So it's always better to just add a second layer or maybe you thought you were only going to do two layers, but you're like, ah, I can still see some spots that don't look great. Let me do a third layer. That's probably better than 
you know, trying to get it all in one or two, one or two coats. And if you do have runs, this is what I found was helpful. So when I was working on this file cabinet and it, and I had it standing upright, and even though I was trying to take my time, there were still runs, I had a microfiber cloth and I just dabbed the paint, right? So you just sort of scrunch it up in your hand and you just dab at these runs. And I didn't even try to like totally fix the area because I knew this was my first coat. Second coat, I'm going to have everything laying down. It's going to look better, but I would just dab at it and then very lightly try to fill it in just a little bit. And then on the second coat, that's when everything started looking more clear and more covered, I should say. So try that when you're spray painting, dab it if you do notice, and then try to go over it very lightly, very quick to kind of fill in that indentation. But if it's not completely filled in, don't worry about it. You can let it dry and then you can do another coat just to make it all one even uh, coverage. Now let's talk about what spray paint to use. I mean, I think Home Depot brands, which is like Rust-Oleum and Lowe's brands, they use Krylon. I think they might have another brand or two there. I think they're pretty good quality spray paints. I would just say, don't go to the dollar store or Family Dollar, or any of those places, those cheap places and buy these off brands of spray paint. I just wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. In fact, there was a Facebook friend I don't know. I don't remember who it was, but I just remember looking at her post real quick and whatever spray paint she was using, it was not turning out. And she was so frustrated. And she even said, oh, I wish I wouldn't have bought this cheap spray paint. Well, yeah, don't, you know, don't do it. Just, just buy good quality spray paint. And, you know, you also have to know what kind of paint to use. So like, for example, if you're spray painting metal, which in like my case, I am, you would definitely want to use the like, let's say Rust-Oleum brand, and it's called Stops Rust. This is made specifically for metal. If you're painting plastic, Rust-Oleum makes the other spray paint. You know, that we see so many of them on the shelf. But if it says wood, plastic, you know, you can use that spray paint. But if you're painting metal, then I would go with the Stops Rust variety. I know Magnolia Home they're selling at Lowe's, which is a Joanne, Joanna Gaines line. I've actually been wanting to try some of her products. And I'm, I'm wondering how that spray paint is. It's probably pretty good. So I've been wanting to try that. And there's another brand. Several years ago, I tried this. I personally didn't like it. It's called Color Shot. You may have seen it. I know they had reached out to me several years ago and wanted me to do some advertising for them. And I thought, okay, well, go ahead and send me some of these cans, you know, it's kind of cool. It's supposed to be more environmentally friendly. And I don't remember the offensive materials that it doesn't contain. But I started trying to use this, I did not like it. (laughs) It didn't have primer in it. So it took longer, because I had to go through a separate step of trying to like prime it, and then trying to use this color shot. And I I don't know if maybe I just didn't shake it up properly. I think I'd want to give it another shot. But I just remember at that time thinking, this isn't it. (laughs) I got to switch back to like Rust-Oleum or whatever, because this is just not it. So I would try it again, but I would probably try it on something smaller, not a piece of furniture, but rather maybe like a lamp, a mailbox or something like that, where I could say, okay, well, maybe this is worth it. But if you're someone who is really, really concerned about the environmental impact, you might want to give Color Shot a try. I thought that I could find it at Home Depot. I was searching for it. I found some of their other products, like um, the small craft paints and pens. But for some reason, I couldn't find their spray paint. So maybe you just have to get it from Amazon or whatever. I'll try to leave a link down below. So that's something to try if you really want to be more environmentally friendly and you don't mind having a paint that doesn't have a primer in it that's going to require you to to do primer as well. You can do that. All right, so then that leads me to my next question. Do you need a primer? Well, most spray paints already have primer built in. So you've got like Krylon Fusion at Lowe's, the Rust-Oleum paints, they have primer built into them. But there might be some times when you want to use a separate primer. And this is what happened to me with this metal file cabinet that I'm working on. The metal, as I mentioned earlier, had a little bit of rust. 
So I made sure that I removed that rust and then used something called a clean metal primer. And that was by Rust-Oleum. This, by the way, this podcast is not sponsored by Rust-Oleum. You don't have to use them. I'm just telling you what I've used. So for this particular file cabinet, I used the clean metal primer first. Now, if there was a lot of rust on this and I tried to remove what I could, but there was still a little bit of rust, I would want to use the rusty metal primer that Rust-Oleum makes. And this way you're going to get good adhesion and whatever paint you're putting on, like the, the stops rust, it's going to adhere to it pretty well. Now for me, I decided that, you know what, I'm not going to do the spray paint, which I was going to do the spray paint, the color beyond the primer, I should say, the pigmented color. But I decided that I was going to use Heirloom Traditionals paint because I had, I think it's Heirloom's Tradition paint, or maybe it's traditional. HTP, I think is what they call it. I was going to use HTP um, because I'd ordered some a few months ago and I've just been dying to like try it out. I'd never used it before. You heard me talking on a recent podcast saying that I was going to use it. I did order like six different colors <laughs> and I hadn't had a chance to use any of it. So this was going to be the great opportunity. And I could use that over top of the primer that's on this metal cabinet. But for you, if you're going to be painting a surface that's going to get touched or rubbed, or there's objects placed on it, like nightstands, I would be sure to roughen the surface up with fine sandpaper first. And then I probably would prime it. If you're, if I'm doing spray paint here, I would do a primer and then I would use just a regular spray paint for, let's say wood, because this is a wood nightstand. And then I would use that that has the primer in it. So you've got multiple layers of primer and then you've got the, the pigment in there too. And here's another tip that I would tell you, definitely invest in a comfort grip and painter's tape. Now the comfort grip is made by Rust-Oleum. There's probably other brands that make it, but I know of Rust-Oleum's and it literally just goes over top of the can so that instead of you having to press with your finger to get the paint out, which can be pretty cramping on the finger, especially if you're doing a lot of spray painting at once, or if you've got arthritis in your hands, the comfort grip will go right over top of that nozzle, that spray nozzle. And as you're squeezing the trigger, it's going to depress the nozzle for you. So it's just more ergonomical. And I personally like using it. If I'm just doing a small job, I don't bother with it. But if I'm doing a lot of spray painting, then I would definitely use that. And painter's tape. There's going to be times when you need to tape off areas that you don't want to get paint on. So be sure that you've got painter's tape. And here's the thing. Frog tape makes one for sensitive, sensitive surfaces. This is important because sometimes if your paint is wet or not even wet, let's say it's dry, but it's still sensitive and you put painter's tape on there, guess what it's going to do? <laughs> it can pull that paint off. So if you get the sensitive, which is... I think the regular frog tape is green, but the sensitive is yellow. Look for the yellow one by frog tape. That one doesn't have as much oomph to it. <laughs> so if you put it down on an area, maybe it's only been dried 30 minutes, but you put it down there because you're trying to tape off, or maybe you're trying to do something decorative, it's not going to rip your paint off. It's very, very gentle. I've used it before on walls. I've really liked it. And it's just always something great to have on hand if you're painting. Now, here's a few things that you may not know about spray paint. You might know this, but maybe for some of you who are newbies, you may not. Okay, so we all know, I think we all know that the tops of the caps represent the color of the spray paint, right? So if you go to the spray paint aisle, you see the color of the cap and you know that's black, that's white, that's orange. But did you know that the sheen or the shininess or flatness of the cap actually represents the sheen of the spray paint? Did you know that? <laughs> or is that new information to you? Right. So for example, semi-gloss paints, the cap is going to be really shiny looking. But if you look at the flat or the satin finishes, those caps tend to be more dull. Like the flat one is totally dull. There's no shine to it at all in that cap. But the satin finish, you'll see that it has a little bit of, little bit of shine to it. But the semi-gloss and the gloss, those are really, really shiny. So that way, you know, you can know what you're buying at a glance. Not only do you know the color, but you know the sheen. And so when you've got this sitting on your shelf and you go to reach for the black, well, 
you don't want to have to go through three or four cans of paint to see, well, is this, is this flat or is this semi-gloss? You're just going to look at the cap and you'll know that it's black, but you'll also know the sheen. Pretty helpful if you didn't know that. Also, did you also know that when you are done with your spray paint cans and it's not empty, maybe it's halfway full, you should turn it upside down and spray it for about five seconds to clear the spray valve? Did you know that? And more importantly, do you do it? <laughs> I can tell you I do not always do that. I know that I should, but I don't always do it. And so what happens is when I come back, it can be clogged sometimes. And then you've wasted half a can of spray paint. So try to remember, I'm going to, you know, remember this for myself going forward. Turn it over, just spray. Once it sprays clear or, you know, there's nothing else coming out then you know that you've cleared it and your spray paint is, is protected for the next time. And you can just, you know, wipe off the cap a little bit just to make sure it doesn't clog the nozzle. Now, this is a tip that I got from Diane at, in my own style. She said that she actually will save the nozzles, the little white tips from empty spray cans before tossing them just in case, just in case another can's nozzle becomes clogged. That way she can just easily swap it out because if you pull it up, it comes right off. She can put on one that's clean, boom, and now she can spray again. That is amazing. I was like, I never thought about saving those. Oh my goodness. <laughs> anyway, I am hopeful that there's something in this podcast that maybe you had learned about spray paint. I think for me, the most important thing is, again, making sure you're cleaning whatever it is that you're doing your painting, make sure you clean it well. And if you can, for furniture, I'm going to say specifically for furniture or for things that are round, or I should not say round, things that are flat, that can be flipped over and just laid down to get a nice even coat. If you can do that, do that. You'll get much better results than just trying to spray paint it standing up. That's very frustrating. <laughs> All right, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this episode. If there's something that you want me to talk about on an upcoming episode, please do send me an email, serene at thriftdiving.com or hit me up on Instagram at thriftdiving. I know someone had mentioned that they want me to talk about digital storage. Like how do I store all of my pictures and videos and things like that? I seriously, seriously want to talk about that, but I'm still trying to figure out my strategy. I have actually been working on this project. It's been something on my list that I've been doing well, I started, but I never finished. I can't tell you how many external hard drives. In fact, if I look, I can probably count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think I've got seven external hard drives and they're all full of thrift diving pictures and videos, but I've got thousands and thousands of family photos and videos. How do you organize all that stuff? How do you make sense of it so that you can go back and look at it so it's not just something sitting on an external hard drive or something that's on the cloud? So that's something that I'm still working on. That's going to be coming up in a future episode. Once I figure out how exactly I'm organizing everything, I'm going to come back to you and say, hey, guess what? This is what works for me. And then maybe that might work for you. But I think, you know, pictures and videos are so important to me. I love taking pictures and videos. Because if you don't know, you may not know, I have a horrible memory. Like if I don't take a picture of it or a video clip, I sometimes don't even remember that it happened. My brain has been like this for years. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story. Years ago, I was talking to some of my old high school senior classmates and they were talking about the 10 year reunion. And I was like, oh my gosh, man, I'm so upset. I missed that. They were like, Serena, you were there. I was like, what? I was? Oh, I don't really remember. I kind of remember. Was I? Okay, maybe I was. Seriously, that's how bad my memory is. <laughs> so when I take pictures of things, it allows me to remember just that little bit of time. And, you know, so my pictures and my videos are very, very important to me. And I like to go through them often to not just remember things, but to, I don't know, see how my life was, to see the things I was doing with my kids and how they've changed and how they've grown. And, you know, if you're someone like me who loves taking pictures and videos, maybe you have a better memory, but you also want to create a way to review these often 
and and store them in a way that you're not going to lose them, that you're always going to be able to go back and find what you're looking for. So I'm trying to still figure out how to go about doing this and, and have it be in a way that is not too time consuming, but that it also allows me to find what I'm looking for at any moment, right? Like if I want to say, okay, let me go back to when my son was five years old, my oldest son, how do I find those pictures? Right now they're all over the place and I've got multiple places online where I'm trying to back them up to the cloud and yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a mess. So I'm working on that. And once I figure out how I'm going to do all that, then I'll bring it back to you and say, Hey, guess what? This is what's working for me. Here's what I found, or here's what I researched that might work for you. So if you've got other ideas, including that one that was brought up to me recently by someone who's listening, you know who you are, uh, please do email me serene at thriftdiving.com because I would love to, to find some topics that are of interest to you as well as other people. All right, guys, that's what I got for you this week. I hope you enjoy your upcoming week. School is going to be starting next Monday for my kids. I'm looking forward to it. You know why? I need to get back on track. And I did tell you in the last episode, episode 79, that I've been listening to some productivity books and I'm still listening to the productivity books. I've not really moved much further, but I'm working on it. And I'm hoping once they're back in school, I'll be able to get back on track with my routine emails to my readers and more videos and just being back on track. All right, guys, that's what I got for you this week. And I will look forward to talking to you next week. I'll see you next episode.